Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is that you're watching this. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name's Larry Erickson, and for the next almost half hour, I'm going to be ranting away at you at things that I think are important, important enough for you to know about and maybe even do something about. Uh, if you have any reactions to the show, comments, questions, criticisms, tips, whatever, you can send them to me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And um, if you didn't catch that, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can get the email address from there, or if you prefer, you can leave a comment there. Uh, as always, I do ask that if you email me to uh, please include something in the, uh, in the subject line that makes it clear it's not spam, and be a little patient about getting an answer because I'm kind of slow about answering email. But I do answer, you will get an answer. All right, with that, uh, I, every week I try to start off with some bits of good news. Uh, so I've got a few this week to start. Um, the first of which has to do with voter ID. Now, this is something I haven't talked about in a while, but I suspect that as uh, election time gets closer, it's going to come up more and more. Now, just as a quick reminder, the voter ID issue uh, uh, involves demands that prospective voters produce some form of approved photo ID at the polling place in order to be allowed to cast a ballot. Uh, the supposed purpose of this is to prevent in-person voter fraud, something the right wing claims is rampant in this country. But the thing is, first, in fact, in-person voter fraud is almost non-existent. The rate is usually measured in terms of something like, you know, one ten thousandth of one percent. Um, in fact, the, the numbers are so small that Stephen Colbert once joked about this. He said, our democracy is under siege from an enemy so small it could be hiding anywhere. The second thing about this is that the people who are most likely to be affected by these laws are the poor and minorities, uh, students, and the elderly. Now, what this means is that the move essentially would not prevent in-person voter fraud because it really doesn't happen anyway, but it would serve to disenfranchise millions of prospective voters. And uh, by the way, at least three of those groups, most effective and a good part of the fourth, tend to vote liberal. And um, the demands for photo ID, which would disenfranchise a lot of those people, again, those demands come largely from the right wing, which I suppose, I'm sure, is just a coincidence. Anyway, the point of this is that there has been some sense in varying quarters that the move for demanding photo ID from voters had kind of peaked, it kind of reached its crest and was, and was starting to wane. Uh, we actually now have a little bit of evidence for that. Uh, the effort to place a voter photo ID on the ballot in Nevada this November has now failed miserably. Uh, organizers had to turn in 100,000 valid signatures by 5 p.m. on Tuesday, June 17th. That deadline came and went, and the effort failed so badly that uh, uh, registrars in at least two Nova uh, counties in Nevada said that they had not gotten any petitions at all. Now, this doesn't mean the effort for photo ID for voter suppression is dead, including in Nevada. The organizers could always just try again. But it does appear to mean that it's becoming harder to convince people that this mythology of voter fraud is so important that it actually outweighs the ability of people to be able to vote. And the fact that that concept that photo ID is necessary to solve a non-existent problem, the fact that that concept is getting harder to sell, that's good news. All right, next up this week on the good news front, we have the fact that Barack Obama has decided to do the right thing, which frankly happens sufficiently rarely that it's worthy of notice when it happens. The amazing Mr. O has directed his staff to prepare an executive order that would prohibit federal contractors from discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. And that's something that Obama has been promising to do for six years now, uh, dating all the way back to his very first campaign for president in 2008. 
What appears what finally brought this to a head was that last year, the Employee Non-Discrimination Act, which would ban again, discrimination on, on uh, gender identity and uh, sexual orientation, everybody thought it was going to pass Congress last year, and it didn't. It failed. Um, meaning it was still legal under federal law for members of the LGBT community to be fired or to be denied public accommodations on that basis alone. Now, Obama can't do anything about the public accommodation uh, part of this on his own. However, he can say that any company that does business with the federal government, um, and if you count, in fact, both direct federal employees and contractors who do business with the federal government, you're talking about nearly a quarter of the entire workforce. Uh, he can say that any company that does business with the federal government cannot discriminate on the basis of, again, sexual orientation or gender identity as a condition for getting that contract. Um, now it appears that Obama has finally faced up to the fact that Congress is not going to fix this, so he's going to have to step up and do it if he's ever going to. And it appears now that he intends to do just that, and that again is good news. Uh, finally for this week about good news, uh, another bit of good news comes from another pretty unexpected front, the Supreme Court of the United States. On June 16th, the court dealt a rare but sharp rebuke to the gun nuts when it declared that two lower courts were correct when they ruled against so-called straw purchases, which is where one person buys a gun intending it to be for another person. Now, the primary purpose of a straw purchase, bluntly, the primary purpose of this, is to hide the identity of the actual owner of the gun. Uh, and, and that, frankly, is something that it more, than, more than rarely is done for criminal purposes. It's, it's one of the purposes of having gun buyers have to identify themselves uh, and fill out a form is to have some chance of tracing that gun. Allow, now, in this case, the majority of the Supreme Court uh, reasoned that allowing straw purchases then makes no sense. Um, and actually, allowing straw purchases defeats the purposes of the registration laws in the first place. This case involved a former cop who bought a gun for an uncle in another state. And during this time, the cop signed a federal form saying he was the actual buyer of the gun. He was convicted of making a false statement on the form. Now, his attorney argued that because both of these men were, in fact, legally allowed to own a gun, there was no crime because... Get this, he said, Congress was, quoting him, not concerned about the ultimate recipients of firearms or what happens to a gun after it leaves the gun store. To which I can only respond, say what? I mean, what's the point of the form at all then? What is the point of the registration at all if it's only so supposed to apply for the time it takes that person to get to the door of the gun shop? Fortunately, a majority of the Supreme Court recognized the absurdity of that argument. They agreed with the lower courts. Eleanor Kagan, writing for the majority, argued that had the cop told the truth on the form that the gun was intended for someone else, the sale could not have been completed because the uncle would not have undergone the required background check, which means he got the gun under false pretenses. Now, there is a down part of this good news, which is that this case was decided by a bare five to four majority, which means that the four right-wing members of the Supreme Court want people, in effect, to be able to buy guns secretly. They want people to be able to obtain gun shops, uh, guns from gun shops, rather, without having to go through a background check, even though studies show that background checks, which are supported by overwhelming majorities, not only of Americans, but also of gun owners, that background checks do help keep guns out of the hands of people who should not have access to them, and they do reduce gun violence. But these four members of the Supreme Court, it seems, frankly, that they simply just do not care. They'd rather prefer to chant along with the nutside rabbit brains of America, all for guns and guns for all. So this may not seem like a big win, but it is a win. And we're dealing with the gun nuts, any win is a big one. 
Uh, actually, talking about guns and uh, gun nuts and their gun nuttery brings us to one of our regular weekly features. It's the Clown Award, given for meritorious stupidity, this week complete with special commendation for intellectual cowardice. This week, the big red nose goes to CNN. The last week I told you about a group called Every Town for Gun Safety. It compiled a list of 74 school shootings since Newtown. Now, in what has accurately been called a shameful and mind-numbingly insensitive move, CNN has decided that most of those 74 school shootings do not count. In fact, CNN has decided that only 15 of those 74 are real, honest-to-gosh, school shootings, even though the other 59 resulted in 25 dead and 40 more wounded. Now, how did they decide this? Well, CNN decided that only those 15 were school shootings because they were the only ones that involved someone walking into a school or onto a campus and just start shooting. If the shootings arose as the result of an argument or gang activities or whatever, then, well, those just didn't make the cut. In fact, the standard used by CNN is a little hard to figure out because it apparently didn't matter whether the targets of the, uh, the shooter were deliberately chosen or were they random. Um, so then you might think, well, then maybe the issue is premeditation. But a suicide, which obviously was premeditated, again, didn't make the cut. Ultimately, it seems that CNN looked for a way to eliminate every instance that they could not find a way to say was not fundamentally the same as Newtown, except in the number of bodies. Now, you know, beyond the student who committed suicide in full view of his classmates, among the incidents not included in CNN's revived list, according to Think Progress, were a brawl that escalated outside a college basketball game at Chicago State University, a shooting at a Mississippi town's football game that left a 15-year-old dead, and a Georgia college that saw two shootings in two days. Okay, that's the how. What about the why? Well, that is actually even easier to figure out. CNN backpedaled right after right-wingers started attacking the original list. This attack started with a series of tweets from a so-called journalist named Charles Johnson, who makes his living writing for various right-wing rags telling people what they want to hear. Johnson sent out this whole long series of tweets. In each one, he referred to some incident on the list as another fake. Apparently these were real school shootings. They weren't even, I don't know, they were fake. A chant that these were fake was almost instantly taken up by the rest of the right-wing media as its hive mind usually does. And of course, in light of this, CNN almost immediately caved. Because my gosh, you know, you gotta understand, how could any self-respecting news media be expected to stand by its own reporting when challenged by the intellectual heavyweights at sites like, and these are the real names, The Daily Caller, Hot Air, and Pajamas Media? Well, actually, I can tell you who could be expected to do that. Any news media unwilling to let its news coverage be determined by a collection of right-wing hacks which unfortunately is a description which apparently does not apply to CNN. So CNN, you've shown yourself to be both moronic and gutless, more interested in placating the right wing than in truth or accuracy or even defending your own reporting, with the result that you have downplayed the deadly continuing toll of guns. CNN, you are a clown. But you know, the thing is, what's really amazing, what's really amazing about, uh, about this is, is how the concept of guns has penetrated our culture. Now, I don't really mean gun ownership per se. In fact, the number of people who own guns in this country has been slowly declining over the years, even as the number of guns owned has been increasing. In other words, fewer and fewer people are owning more and more guns each. What I mean, however, is the idea of guns, the idea of guns as a routine part of our culture. So I want to give a couple of examples to illustrate just how far this madness has gone. On June 27th, 
The administration of Preston Memorial Hospital in Kingswood, West Virginia is staging a community barbecue, during which the hospital plans to raffle off a matched set of Ruger handguns with 357 and 44 Magnum cartridges. What that makes this even more insane is that this is at least the second year they have done this. Tickets this year are $20, and proceeds benefit, quoting, the PMH Foundation Building for a Healthy Future Capital Campaign. Put a little less clumsily, the guns are being raffled off as a fundraiser for expanding the hospital, an expansion which I sincerely hope includes an expanded emergency department. And the thing is that this is not even an isolated case. It's not even an isolated case. In March, uh, as a part of a bid to attract more people to its pews, the Grace Baptist Church in Troy, New York, gave away an AR-15 assault rifle in a free raffle. The only requirement was you had to be in church on that day. Pastor John Coletus said the event was to honor hunters and gun owners, and he went on, and I'm quoting him here, we're being a blessing and a help to people who have been attacked viciously attacked by socialist and anti-Christian people, the politicians and the media. The church actually promoted this event with flyers saying, win a free AR-15 right above a quote taken from John chapter 14 verse 27, my peace I give unto you. And yes, they did spell peace, P-E-A-C-E, not P-I-E-C-E. Pastor Coletus claimed, the Bible is replete with defending yourself and arming yourself and being capable of defending yourself. In other words, apparently the Bible can serve as a tactical military manual. Now the article did not uh, specify any of the replete passages, which the pastor may have cited, but I guess here's one passage that wouldn't make his list. I'm quoting, you have heard that, you have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you that you resist not evil, that whosoever shall smite you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue you at law and take away your coat, let him have your cloak too. And whosoever shall compel you to go a mile, go with him too. Give to him that asks you, and from him that would borrow of you, do not turn away. You have heard it has been said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. That is the book of John, chapter 5, verses 38 to 44. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount, which I take it does not appear in the Bible that uh, Pastor Coletus uses. Nor, apparently, does it appear in the Bible used by the Lone Oak First Baptist Church of Paducah, Kentucky, which a couple of weeks before the Grace Church barbecue in March drew 1,300 people to a steak dinner at a church hall by raffling off, having a free raffle of 25 different rifles. So many of us have become so used to guns, so inured to the death machines that they actually are and are intended to be, that by the end of the first week in June, the TSA had discovered 892 guns in passengers' carry-on luggage at airport security checkpoints. That's a 19% increase from the comparable period for the year uh, a year before, which was a record at the time. 80% of these guns were loaded. Why were these people trying to carry loaded guns past a security checkpoint? Usually the excuse was, I forgot it's there. John Pierce, a Virginia lawyer and co-founder of a group called OpenCarry.org, which campaigns for, quoting the group, the right to openly carry properly holstered handguns in daily American life, said that those, that this guy Pierce said that uh, for those for whom firearms are not a part of their daily lives, they might find it hard to understand uh, people who, for whom carrying a gun is second nature. Well, the thing is, Mr. Pierce, no, that's not it, because I can understand that. That is the problem. You are so connected to a gun, a loaded gun, that you can forget you have a loaded gun in your carry-on bag, as if a loaded gun was no more consequential than a cell phone or an extra pair of shorts. 
more than that, more important than that, our love of guns, our mythos of guns, our identification with guns has gone beyond an acceptance. For too many, it's gone beyond even an obsession to a sort of mental illness, a psychosis driven by a constant state of fear combined with a feeling of powerlessness over our own lives, over an inability to manage or even improve our own lives, a psychosis to the point where we imagine Jesus packing heat and expect at every, any moment a crazed murderer, rapist, terrorist to come crashing through our front door. New York State Assemblyman uh, Steve McLaughlin, who attended the service at the church in Troy, New York, said he couldn't understand why that event would be controversial. The thing is, for the most part, it's not. And that, again, is the problem. We're taking a break. And here we are back. We're going to start this part of the show with uh, what we can consider as an update or follow-up to something uh, I talked about last week. Uh, last week, I reported on the good news that some states and cities have uh, finally responded to the lack of federal uh, action on uh, by uh, setting out to increase the minimum wage to be paid in their jurisdictions. So, as I said at the time, the federal minimum wage remains a paltry $7.25 an hour. Now, how low was that? Had it been adjusted for inflation on a regular basis, it would be at least 10.68 an hour, and had it kept up with increases in worker productivity, it would be nearly $22 an hour. Instead, it is one of the lowest in the industrialized world. In fact, it's so low that the U.S. is starting to get shamed by the rest of the world. On June 16th, the International Monetary Fund came out with its latest economic forecast. And for the U.S., it uh, cut its forecast for U.S. economic growth this year and forecast sluggish growth for years to come and said that one of the things that should be done to reverse that trend was increasing the minimum wage. Quoting the report, given its current low level compared both to U.S. history and international standards, the minimum wage should be increased. This would help raise incomes for millions of working poor and help ensure a meaningful increase in after-tax earnings for the nation's poorest households. Now, of course, however, the problem is that the after-tax earnings for the nation's poor means nothing to the, uh, uh, to the rich as long as their after-tax in, uh, earnings increase which is doubtless part of the reason why just eight days after Seattle enacted its ordinance, uh, raising its minimum wage to $15 over the next several years, a lobbying group, just eight days later, a lobbying group representing employers like McDonald's and Taco Bell filed suit asking the courts to repeal the legislation. Now, some of the arguments in this suit are laughably frivolous. One of them actually claims that this law violates the First Amendment rights of free speech of the corporations because it could reduce the amount of money they have to advertise. Which, of course, would mean that any cost imposed on business would be unconstitutional on the same basis. Now, there's too much in this suit for me to talk about here, uh, but I may come back to it uh, because its arguments were described as one commenter as an, an attempt to repeal the 20th century. Uh, which probably wouldn't surprise anyone who remembers that right-wing darling George Will once wrote in his syndicated column that back to 1900 is a reasonable summation of the conservatives' goal. As a footnote to this, we can mention that it's not only minimum wage workers that are getting screwed. According to a new global comparison by the International Trade Union Confederation, the U.S. ranks in the bottom half of the world when it comes to labor rights. The ITUC has a five-point scale, with the best being one and the worst being five, based on a 97-point evaluation of the state of labor rights in each country. Uh, the U.S. scores a four, joining other nations where the ITUC finds systematic violations of workers' rights. The only country in North or Central America to get a five was Guatemala. In fact, American labor rights and union strength have been waning for decades, uh, a, a, a reduction that has accelerated of late. Over the past three years, more than a dozen states have restricted the rights of public employees to unionize or organize, and 19 have taken up these anti-worker, anti-union right-to-work laws. Uh, and it's what's happening is that now, just like in the case of the minimum wage, the world is starting to notice.
All right, now for our other regular weekly feature, it's the outrage of the week. And it seems here we have a streak going. Over the past 10 years, the Commonwealth Fund, which promotes improved health care, has issued five reports ranking Western industrialized nations on the quality of their health care systems. Its most recent report, involving 11 industrialized nations, was released on June 16th, and for the fifth consecutive time, the U.S. ranks dead last. Factors considered included quality, access, efficiency, and equity of health care. There's actually a total of 11 different measures. And the U.S. didn't rank at the bottom of every measure, but it did rank at the bottom overall. In fact, it ranked no higher than third on any of the levels, and that one was the one about the effectiveness of health care. So the business, that's the business about, well, you have the best health care in the entire world. Well, apparently, that's no longer true, if it ever was. At the same time, we are far and away the most costly in terms of health care, so much so that a third of U.S. adults reported skipping a test or a treatment or not filling a prescription because of cost. Uh, we have a shortage of primary care physicians, a lack of primary care for the poor, high infant mortality, uh, inordinate levels of mortality from conditions that could have been controlled, like high blood pressure, on and on and on. It doesn't have to be this way. The UK ranked first. It used to rank a lot lower, but it actually looked at its own health care system, saw what the problems were, and addressed them, which is something we continue to refuse to do, and no, Obamacare is not an answer, not nearly. Bottom line, we pay the most and get the least benefit, and many of us still can't afford or even have access to adequate health care. And we are the worst for the fifth time in a row, and that is an outrage. Okay, last thing for this week, and uh, it may surprise you, and I'm not going to talk about it much, I haven't talked about it more, that's Iraq. Now, I am going to talk about this more, but not this week. Um, but I do. I just wanted to mention two things right now for two weeks. Uh, one is to Mr. to our esteemed uh, uh, Nobel Peace Prize president, Mr. President, just don't, just just don't, don't do the airstrikes. Don't send in special forces. Just don't. The idea that you're going to solve a conflict which has been going on literally for over a thousand years by a few more bombs or a few more special force units is madness. And please stop listening to this nonsense about how Iraq is on the brink of a civil war. It's in a civil war and has been since we invaded. It just cooled down for a little bit. Please do not repeat the stupidity of 2003. And 2003, speaking of that, the other thing I wanted to raise. We are seeing familiar faces in the media. John McCain, Lindsey Graham, Douglas Faith, Paul Bremer, uh, Paul Wolfowitz, Bill Crystal, Judith Miller. Here's the question I have for you. Why are we listening to these people? These are the people now all over the media. These are the people that were disastrously wrong in 2003, disastrously wrong in 2003, and yet now these are the ones that people are going to in order to have them pontificate about Iraq today. Why are we doing this? That's it for this week. I got to get out of here. I'm out of time. Uh, for the moment, you just have the best week you possibly can. We will see you next week. Peace.